So the Advent theme tonight is joy, and uh, we are going to be hearing a message from Ron as he comes to preach, and I'm going to ask if you would just give him a really warm welcome. Clap so hard at home that we can hear you all the way here at the church building. Come on up, Ron. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you haven't heard the message yet, so uh, you know, don't be too premature. Um, let's just have a brief word of prayer. Father, I just pray that you would open all of our hearts and all of our minds to what you have for us uh, in, this, uh, in this sermon. Uh, help me to speak clearly. Help me to speak with joy. Lord, we're going to talk about joy. Help us all to experience what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Advent topic is joy. Joy, like any of the other Advent themes, cannot be put under a microscope to examine or be dissected to learn its component parts. You can look at link, uh, original languages, come up with exhaustive definitions, and all manner of illustrations to gain some understanding into joy and peace and love and hope. But if that's all you've got, they remain only concepts and fall woefully short of what is the scriptures actually intend to communicate to us. One who knows everything about nutrition as an example, how the body processes di different food types, even what the ideal diet might be, but does not eat, will die. Conversely, someone who knows very little about nutrition, but eats good food, will remain healthy. One could know all about nutrition, but until they experience the eating, they will not receive the nutrients their body needs to be healthy. And the point is, joy, like hope and peace and love, need to be experienced as spiritual realities for them to be meaningful at all. You need to feel them. Joy is so powerful, it overcomes, it cancels despair, depression, sadness. And the word that came to my mind as I was thinking about this, boredom. I think I'm more afraid of boredom than the other ones that I just mentioned. We have all experienced episodes in our lives where we perhaps despair or depressed or certainly bored. And if joy does come, they evaporate like smoke and disappear. So today, if your faith seems routine, familiar, mundane, dare I say boring, what you need is joy, the joy of the Lord. So where does it come from? We can experience joy in this world, a sort of joy through our natural circumstances. We have some semblance of joy when a baby is born, when the mortgage is paid, when we get the new car or move into our forever home. But these are temporary and fall short of the joy that comes from knowing the source of eternal joy. For those, those of us who are followers of Jesus, disciples of Christ, we know that joy comes from God, from God himself, by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul pointed this out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. He spoke to the very new baby believing Christians. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Joy is also the fruit of the same Holy Spirit who indwells the follower of Christ. Scott read that in, in lighting the joy candle, the Advent candle. And 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we have all been baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, meaning everybody, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. You've heard me say it before many times. It's a theme that I think is so important to drive home and repeat. If you are believing in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, learning to live by him and yield to his 
influence, that's a different matter, but the potential is there to, for you to live a spirit-filled life. Joy will occur naturally, regularly, even organically, as we walk in the Spirit and yield to his influence. But we're also told in Scripture to rejoice in the Lord as an exhortation, implying that we have a certain capacity to choose joy, even when we're not feeling it. Are you feeling it? Perhaps you're familiar with the Scripture, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, this verse comes from an actual account in Israel's history when the exiles were returning to Jerusalem and were grieving openly and loudly as God's law was being read to them by their, by their leaders. When Nehemiah heard this, this loud grieving, he spoke this phrase that we know so well. He says, do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength, in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. So we can be exhorted to be joyous, and that is a valid thing to decide in your heart that I want to have joy, I'm going to pursue this. But what if we know all this and still rarely experience joy? One of the main premises of my sermon is that joy comes from our circumstances. Not your physical life in the body circumstances, however, not the kind of joy we're, we're aiming at here, but your spiritual, eternal circumstances. And the trick is to train yourself to believe that they are true and they actually are your circumstances. So what I want to do is give you a simple blueprint, perhaps a recipe that I believe will regularly produce deep spiritual joy as it is followed. And the blueprint is found in Peter's first letter in chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Blueprint for joy. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed. Oop, sorry, PowerPoint faux pas. There we go. Verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Sorry, it's a long passage of scripture, not, um, uh, verses 3 to 9, but my sermon is not going to be that long, don't worry. <laughs> this passage brings out some spiritual realities circumstances that require our attention, that will produce joy, profound joy, unspeakable joy, joy that will last and become an increasing feature in our lives and our walks of following Jesus our Lord. And the first thing that I want us to point out that we're to greatly rejoice in, you see in verse 6 there, well, we'll get to verse 6. It says, in this we greatly rejoice. Well, the first thing we're to greatly rejoice in is the past. We're to greatly rejoice that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, that happened some time ago. It was in the past. 
This event abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We must greatly rejoice in this. Because Jesus rose, we have a living hope. We sing that song, that beautiful song this evening. Christ, our living hope. He is our living hope. So we rejoice in this past event of Christ's resurrection from the dead. It means so much, but it ought to produce much joy in our hearts as we consider it. And we also rejoice in our past. You see it there in the verse. Our new birth into a living hope. We are to rejoice in our initial salvation when we first called upon the name of the Lord. What Peter calls our new birth here. Jesus' resurrection is an illustration of our new birth from spiritual death to spiritual life. Ephesians chapter 2 brings this out powerfully. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Have you ever thought of yourselves as being dead before you met Christ? It's what the Bible tells us over and over and over again. But because of his great love for us, down to verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We were dead without hope and without God, but we have been made alive, given new birth into a living hope. This is cause for great rejoicing. And we're also to greatly rejoice in our future. Verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We greatly rejoice in our future. Our future in eternity is often represented in Scripture with this idea of inheritance. And an inheritance is something beneficial, in the natural anyway, something beneficial that you receive, property or or money perhaps, from a relative for no other reason than that you are related to them. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. My favorite illustration of this idea of illustration happened in the, in the late 2000s, uh, this news story broke. Um, speaking of two brothers that were in their 40s that lived in a cave outside of the city of Budapest in Hungary. They were so poor, all they could live was in a cave. And they existed by finding scraps of garbage and junk and made them into little trinkets and sold them. Their family was a disaster. Their mother had abandoned them. They didn't know really much about their extended family at all. And then something very strange happened and incredible. Their maternal grandmother, who was in Germany, passed away. And because they were living relatives, they were entitled to a portion of her estate. And this woman's estate was worth $6.6 billion dollars. Not million, billion, none of this lousy million stuff. That's not, you know, that's not even that impressive. $6.6 billion from a cave to $6.6 billion through inheritance. I just find that the most beautiful illustration of our eternal hope in Christ. Our lives here, compared to what is coming for us, I think will amount to us living in a cave, selling trinkets that we find in the garbage. And in this... We should have great joy. Colossians, 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 it's a new book in the Bible. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Paul is gushing to the Colossian believers about this new life in Christ. And he speaks of us giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance 
of the holy people in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Joyful thanks to God will well up in us as we realize what is in our future, that we have a share in his estate. And we're also to rejoice in our final salvation. Peter knows something spectacular is coming as the final installment of this great salvation. We know this will include a transformation where we trade in this lowly, weak, decaying, sin-ruined body we now have for a serious upgrade. The words scripture used to donate, uh, pardon me, to denote this transformation, the Greek word is metamorphosis. They whet our appetite from perishable to imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power. Ultimately, our Lord Jesus is the prototype. We will receive a glorious resurrection body like his. That's my hope tonight. I hope it's yours, and it causes me great joy when I consider it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter, Paul summarizes so many of his ideas with this one verse. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, the man of dust, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, the man from heaven. And in this we greatly rejoice. So we rejoice. We have great joy in the past and in the future. And I wonder if there's anybody that can guess what our third source of great joy should be. We should have great joy (laughs) in our presence, in our present. Verse 6 in this, uh, verse 6 of our home text, pardon me. In all this, you greatly rejoice, speaking of what was before, though now, speaking of our present existence, our present life, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, speaking of the gold, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. The gold will perish. Your faith won't. In Peter's economy, faith is more precious, more valuable than gold. Keep in mind that in his day, and I thought probably in our day too, gold is the most valuable thing, worldly speaking, representing all that this world can deliver. And the process that God uses for every believer to grow our faith is to allow us to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And yes, we are to greatly rejoice in this process. It's hard as it seems. I don't get the goosebumps from this part of the sermon, but I am challenged to see something beyond the immediate circumstances of my life. James says this exact exact same thing as Peter does. Consider a pure joy in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whether you, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is a hard one, I know. But the knowledge that God is supernaturally equipping you through the trials of life Helping your faith to be strengthened should produce joy for us. This is God's chosen method, and it's only for a little while, because this life is only for a little while. But during this process of suffering grief, there's another pattern that is occurring that runs alongside, um, like two train tracks running together. And this is our walk of faith with Jesus himself. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is our day-to-day walk. This should be the pattern of our life that runs concurrently with our trials. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, his person and his work. Now, faith is being certain of what we do not see, and we cannot see Jesus. And I'm sorry, anybody that says they have seen him in the physical, I, I, I have not sure that that's possible. Peter doesn't seem to think it is. We cannot see him. But we do perceive him spiritually because his spirit is in us. This so much so that the same author who defines faith in Hebrews 11 as being certain of what we do not see tells us in chapter 2 that we do see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We perceive Christ spiritually in our inner being. This trusting reliance on the person and the accomplishments of Jesus Christ for, on our behalf is the faith that Peter is convinced is more precious, more valuable than gold. And it leads to an ongoing desire to know him more and more in a spiritually real way. This is why Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, literally in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And if you remember as a church, we went through the book of Philippians a little while ago. Chapter 3 and verse 10 starts off simply, I want to know Christ. Something had gotten into the apostles something of the worth, of the treasure of knowing this Jesus. And so we can see from this passage in 1 Peter a blueprint or a recipe if you're more a cook, oriented toward cooking, which I'm not. I like the eating. I don't like the cooking so much. This blueprint addresses our past and our future and are present by directing our gaze to the spiritual and eternal realities of our union with Christ, our actual circumstances, and helping us to avert our gaze away from this world that can cause a drifting from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. We do have to live in this world, but we can't let it define us or shape our priorities. We are to greatly rejoice in the past because Jesus rose from the dead because he has saved us. We are to greatly rejoice in our future because of our promised inheritance and the culmination of our salvation that will occur at that time. And we are to greatly rejoice in our present, even our present trials that produce faith and our ongoing fellowship with the person of Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's my sermon. But I have a little extra for you. It's like dessert. If we're going to follow the the recipe theme, it's like a little bit of dessert. Or the blueprint theme, it's like when you get your house built and the guy throws in a gazebo in the back for free. Well, this is kind of like that. I'm calling it an, an addendum for joy. A little little bit extra help to find a good source of joy. This passage came to my mind when I was thinking about the sermon topic, and to my knowledge, it had nothing to do with joy, and I wondered about this. 
So I flipped open to Isaiah 55. Many of us are familiar with it about God's word as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The very next verse. The very next verse. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Now, no doubt God has many purposes for his word. But the first two purposes he gives us directly after this foundational passage to understanding God's word is that the believer would experience joy and peace in their life. This is spectacular. Perhaps you're in the, uh, the habit of paying attention to news feeds on your smartphone or your computer. I confess today I went through the Facebook feed a little bit. I haven't done it in a long time. I quickly repented, and now it won't be for a long time again. I'm, I'm kidding. But I want to just urge us all to divert some of the time that we pay attention to news feeds, to buzz feeds, and pay attention to God's feed, his news feed, his testimonies and truth that can build you up, sanctify you, and give you an inheritance that will make the story of the two brothers inheriting billions seem like nothing. The result will be lasting joy and peace. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. I was about to leave and exit. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. I just want you all to know anybody that's watching, uh, being filmed with very few people here. It's, uh, it's unnerving, but we are making the most of it. So let's pray together. Father, we need your joy. We want your joy. We want the joy of the Lord to be our strength. We want it to be a fixture in our lives. We don't want to hear, we don't want to just hear the word, but we want to experience it in our heart, a joy that will overcome so many things that this uh, life plagues us with. I pray that for all your people who call upon your name, who believe in you, that you'd help us to experience your great and marvelous joy through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I just thought that was an awesome word. You know, often we think about the joy of the Lord being uh, avail available to us no matter what our circumstances. And of course, we understand what that means. And, uh, and of course, it's true. But the reality is, if you look at it more clearly, it's really because of our circumstances in what awaits us and what he has done for us and even what he's doing right now, uh, though it's not always easy, it is, it is a cause for joy because he's doing amazing things. And that is just a really, really great word. Thanks so much, Ron. I really enjoyed that. It's awesome. We're going to say a benediction, and I just want to encourage you to lift your hands and uh, join in this. And uh, just in faith, speak this over your brothers and sisters. And uh, pardon me, it's not a benediction, really. It's a, a doxology. So let's just really uh, glorify the Lord with what, we are, with what we are saying right now. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.